Is food actually healthier for us because it's labeled as health food? For a long time now, many companies have begun jumping aboard various bandwagons of health food fads, from organic and non-GMO to gluten-free to vegan and vegetarian alternatives to meat-based products, and often charge a premium for those products. Items like the Impossible Whopper have exploded across social media in popularity due to how seemingly incredible it is for a meatless burger to taste just as good as one with meat, and to be cholesterol-free to boot. Patty with zero milligrams of cholesterol, 17 grams of protein, 100% Whopper, and 0% beef. We know it's impossible to believe. But is it really better for you, and is it possible for us to be so easily persuaded by advertising as to think that food is healthier just based on how it's labeled? The answers may be far more disconcerting than you might expect when we look at the scientific data. Let me preface this video by saying that I'm not here to tell you what kind of diet you should be following. You do you, boo. It's absolutely no skin off of my nose if you want to be a carnivore or a breatharian. I don't care. Don't care. Still don't care. And besides, why would you listen to someone who looks like me for health advice? But what does bother me, as someone who studies media psychology, is when I see media messages being used as persuasive tools to influence consumers into making decisions that may not be in the best interest either of their wallet or their gullet. Specifically, I'm talking about the excessive marketing surrounding vegan and vegetarian options from various fast food chains over the last year or so that I've seen plastered across the media landscapes of late, with perhaps no example again more prominent than that of Burger King's Impossible Whopper. Admittedly, I have not tried the Impossible Whopper, but by all accounts it is supposedly quite indistinguishable from the traditional Burger King Whopper and quite delicious. Not being a fan of burgers myself, I know, a heresy as a proud Burgerlander, I'm not particularly keen to try it either way. But hey, it's vegan, so it must be healthier than the traditional option, right? And given the ongoing obesity epidemic across much of the modern world, that must be a good thing for public health. But is it? Well, not really. Let's compare the nutritional information of some of the meatless alternatives at some of the US's various popular fast food chains and see for ourselves. Immediately here, we can see that the supposedly healthy vegan and vegetarian options aren't so much healthier than your average dose of McBeatus, as the Impossible Whopper has 30 fewer calories than the beef-based one, but also has 240 milligrams more sodium. While the McVegan is lower in calories, it contains over twice the sodium of a regular Big Mac, weighing in at 2.6 grams of salt, which is just under half of your total recommended daily intake, yet still only half the amount found in the average game of Marvel. Scoops. Scoops hagen the White Castle Impossible Slider is higher again in both calories and sodium than its meaty counterpart, containing nearly twice the saturated fat, and while the Del Taco Beyond Taco has the same calorie count as the regular, it too is much higher in sodium. Taking this all into consideration, and then taking a look at the freaking price tags on these things, will we? what exactly are you paying for? The Impossible Slider is over twice the cost of the original humble bite of mini meat on a bun, and every other meatless option is priced significantly higher than the fast food delights of a meat-laden variety. So why pay more for food that's just as bad for you, if not worse? Well, because green is good and vegetarian is healthy. Therefore, eating a vegetarian or vegan burger must be healthy, right? Despite how big our brains are, using those big brains at full force all of the time requires a ton of energy. Thus, we heavily rely on cognitive heuristics to help us make quick decisions in our day-to-day -day lives. As a result, oft-repeated media messages can have a major impact on our decision-making process when it comes to a simple food choice. We are often affected by basic media primes when it concerns something as basic as deciding what to eat that day. But that inherently means that the choices we make based on these primes are usually unlikely to be healthier. So, are we really so easily influenced by a label? Vegan, vegetarian, organic, fair trade, and so on? Let's examine the effects that mere labeling can have on our brains and our bodies. But since this video is about how advertisers manipulate people, let me first tell you about a way that you can get around a lot of targeted advertising that comes with browsing the web. 
And that's today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is a VPN service that encrypts all of your data, not only protecting your browsing history online, but also blocks ads, malware, and phishing attempts. Targeted ads are not only annoying, but as we'll learn, they can be eerily persuasive, particularly when it feels like they're reading your mind. For example, while researching and after researching this video, I was getting a lot of ads and recommended videos for what else but Burger King and the Impossible Whopper. But with Surfshark, I can can easily just turn it on, either through a Chrome extension, a desktop app, or a mobile phone app, and poof, no more ads. What's also cool about the phone app is by blocking these ads, you can help save mobile data that usually gets gobbled up like a side of fries while trying to access the content you actually care about. And speaking of content you actually care about, Surfshark makes getting access to some of your favorite region-locked shows just a click away. I was recently shocked to see that Always Sunny was available on Netflix, only to discover that that's because it's a UK exclusive. So if you happen to live in the US, well, just watch this. Now you don't see it? Now you do. Region swapping also allows you to quickly shop around for better prices and deals online, so why not take advantage of regional offers and save yourself some dough? A lot of you guys have been saying you want some different options in your choice of VPN, so that's why I'm happy to share a special offer of 84% off a two-year plan with Surfshark VPN by clicking the link in my description and using the code AIDEN. That's A-Y-D-I-N. And when you sign up now, you'll get an extra month absolutely free. For less than $2 a month, you can use this awesome service across an unlimited number of devices. And if you don't like it, no worries, because they have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So check it out. You have nothing to lose but a lot of always sunny binging to gain. So now, with absolute full awareness that I just tried to sell you a product, albeit a product I do think is pretty cool, particularly with their nifty browser extension, and one I specifically thought was a good thing for those of you who are looking for VPN alternatives, let's talk about the power of persuasion in advertising. It's hard to imagine that we really are so gullible as to think food is healthier just because of how it's labeled, but significant research indicates that might be the case. For example, Harris, Bart, and Brownell, 2009, looked at eating behaviors in both adults and children after they were exposed to advertisements for food products, both nutritional and, well, let's just say not so nutritional. In the first of two experiments, children watched a cartoon that included an ad break either for food or for some other type of product, and were given a snack of goldfish crackers during their watch time. Children who watched the food advertisement consumed 45%, an average of 8.8 .8 grams, more of their snack than those who did not see the food-based ad. And this was so regardless of any other individual traits or factors, including the child's existing weight. The researchers predicted that if this behavior were replicated in daily routines, based on the average amount of hours that the children reported watching television per day, it would lead to 94 additional calories consumed and a weight gain of almost 10 pounds per year per child, provided there was no significant increase in the child's physical activity. But as we all know, and as Susan has so reminded us, under the new COPPA restrictions, children are very susceptible to advertising. So what about adults? In an additional study, adult participants watched an episode of Whose Line Is It Anyway? Truly a patrician choice. I couldn't forget that face. He used to bob for fries. That was interspersed with ads either for fast or junk food or for more nutritional products, such as granola bars or orange juice. An additional control group saw no food ads during the show. After watching, they were led into another room full of a number of snack options, ranging from more health-conscious ones, including carrots and celery, to moderately healthy choices, such as trail mix, all the way down to chocolate chip cookies, and what they describe as a cheesy snack mix, which I'm going to assume is Tabasco-flavored Cheez-Its because they're my favorite. Similarly to the kids, adults who saw the junk food ads ate considerably more and ate for a longer period of time than those who saw the nutritional ads or the control group. Despite all participants noting that the cookies and cheesy treats were unhealthy, that didn't really affect those who saw the snack ads, who were ready to chow down on just about everything offered up. There was also a very interesting, but far from unprecedented, effect on restrained eaters. Now, what is a restrained eater, you ask? Well, simply, it refers to someone who is dieting or attempting to watch their weight. In line with previous data, people trying to watch their waistlines who saw the unhealthy ads actually ate far more than those not trying to lose weight. And by far more, I mean woo, just... Look at this graph! 
while they also ate slightly more when they saw the nutritional ads. The difference was minor compared to unrestrained eaters. A gender effect was also present in that men generally tended to eat more than women, but particularly when they saw the snack ads. In Toto, consumption across the genders and eating behavior types was lowest in those who watched the nutritional-based advertisement. Specifically, those who watched the junk food ads were more likely to eat all of the foods available, but did tend to dip their hands more into the cookie jar than any other group, quite literally. Put that cookie down! Now! What all of this means is that we're pretty easily primed by food advertising. I mean, aren't you all just salivating looking at all of these delicious stock images? And that's kind of my point, particularly when the message of advertising regarding these impossible vegan options are hitting both parts of the brain, the heuristic side and the cognitive processing side with pleasing messages. Oh yeah, you can eat this burger, it's got no meat and no cholesterol so it's good for you, but also it tastes exactly like a Whopper? See how that works? probably particularly on those who are restrained eaters, it encourages eating more while also thinking you're eating less. And when the price of an impossible slider is more than twice that of a regular slider, well, that all adds up to more money in the bank for these fast food corporate giants. A more recent study from Dovey et al. 2017 gives us more information here. Participants in this study watched an episode of Friends, which was broken up with ads for candy, health foods, or non-food related products. After watching the episode, they were asked if they would like a snack pack from two options, either one low in fat and salt or one high in fat, sugar, and salt. People who were not highly restrained eaters tended to take the high salt, high fat snack option or both, while those who were watching their weight took the low salt, low fat snack option only when exposed to the nutritional advertisement. When exposed to the candy or the control ads, the highly restrained eaters tended to choose no snack. This might sound good, I mean, hey, they're choosing healthier options or none at all, but consider what this means in the context of advertising that promotes what we know is unhealthy as a healthy option to those trying to lose weight. Ordinarily, someone trying to lose weight might pass on a trip to Berber Creek, but after seeing an ad for their healthy new vegan alternative, well, might as well pick up an impossible Whopper, right? It's a healthy option. People who aren't concerned with watching their weight will eat whatever the heck they want, but people who are may be more likely to eat something that they think is healthy after watching an advertisement or marketing that encourages thoughts about health food eating. In other words, Normally, those watching their weight wouldn't eat anything after watching a fast food commercial, but when that fast food is framed as healthy, they just might. I thought I'd get into shape, so I've been drinking nothing but milkshakes. You mean those diet milkshakes? Uh-oh. Moreover, it's actually pretty easy to manipulate us into wanting to eat something healthy when it's portrayed as particularly ripe and delicious, when we see people happily consuming it, as illustrated in data from Samson and Buzigen 2019. The researchers provided adolescents with images of women just eating a salad or freaking eating a salad. Yeah, boy, you know what I mean. Just look at how absolutely god dang hilarious these salads are. What a hoot. This is called a hedonic appeal. The over-the-top enjoyment of salad mirrors these advertisements, and the social media influencers that are showing themselves gorging on Impossible Whoppers as well. And I don't mean all of them, of course, and obviously, my boy Review Bra is pure and innocent, and I take his word and his word only on these things. But for other people, they're likely to influence others into eating because they seem to be enjoying it so much. And that's illustrated in the data. When students saw people having a grand old time eating their fruit and veggies, combined with a nutritional message, not only were they more accepting of that nutritional message, but they also reported higher positive affect. You know, good vibes. They also found that when they included text-based appeals, such as finger licking goodness, to descriptions of healthy food, participants were more visually fixated on the images of said healthy foods. The student participants both recognized these foods were indeed healthy and were more fixated on them when they were accompanied by a hedonic message emphasizing the delicious taste and appealing imagery of the food items, over utilitarian messages that emphasize their healthiness. In other words, if you constantly insist that these meat substitutes taste just like the real deal and show people losing their dang minds over them and display them in a glorious fashion, as all food is displayed in commercials, let's be real, people are more likely to be drawn to them, even if they aren't overly concerned with their own personal eating habits, but potentially particularly 
if they are. Given that brands and profits is an integral part of these campaigns to sell meatless alternatives as healthier options, it's important to note that our brains may be particularly susceptible to branding concerning food and our eating behaviors, which may be particularly deleterious for those, again, trying to lose weight. Gearheart et al. 2013 had obese, overweight, and lean adolescents watch an episode of a comedy program which was interrupted by commercials, either for popular chain restaurants or for other non-food brands, and then stuck the kids into an fMRI to study the effects the commercials had on their brains. Interestingly, while overweight adolescents had increased activation in the cuneus in response to food commercials, a region of the brain associated with visual processing and attention, cuneus activity was about equal for the restaurant and non-food ads in the obese teens. Additionally, obese participants' regions associated with reward, including the anterior cingulate cortex, were less active than in lean participants. This seems a bit counterintuitive, but may indicate that when heavy people see commercials for food, they actively seek to repress feelings of hunger and satisfaction. However, further data from Masterson, no, not that one. I don't see any women lined up to you, and I would definitely be at the end of that line. Well, if you hit the treadmill a little more, you'd be at the front. At all 2018 may shed some more light on this decreased activation and what it means in terms of behavioral outcomes. In their study, young children between 7 and 10 were shown branded food items, non-branded food items, novel branded food items, or a control of random images and were similarly scanned by fMRI. After the study, the kids were allowed to choose a snack of their choice and their caloric intake was measured. They found increased activity in the left fusiform gyrus, an area of the brain again related to visual processing in response to both food and non-food branded images. Interestingly, activation in the left fusiform was negatively related to caloric intake. However, the researchers also found that overweight kids tended to have generally decreased response in that same region, the left fusiform gyrus, a part of the brain concerned with visual processing. What this all may suggest is that overweight people become somewhat desensitized to branding, which causes decreased visual processing and ultimately may lead to increased consumption. That is, in a roundabout way, attempts of overweight and obese individuals to curb their eating habits with more activation in the ACC may actually end up eating more when exposed to food branding in part due to the decreased activation of their visual processing regions in response to advertisements. I know that was probably confusing, but more importantly, the relationship hasn't been really hammered down yet and it's just kind of my interpretation of the data. So instead, let's look at some more direct effects on the brain of exposure to food advertising, put this into greater perspective and make it a little bit clearer. The previous studies were specifically looking at branded messages, be they commercials for restaurants such as Applebee's or IHOP, or branded food items including Kraft mac and cheese or Keebler cookies. But what about non-branded responses to images of food on the brain? Dimitropoulos et al. 2013 may provide us with some information to further explain how thinking about food in general is different from thinking about branded food items in people of different weight groups. Obese and average weight participants in this study were scanned via fMRI after being shown images of both high and low calorie foods. They were then given a macronutrient-rich hospital meal, so obviously not the most appetizing, but certainly nutritious, which contained a maximum of 750 calories, and then were scanned again by fMRI. As before, the obese group had increased activity in regard to the high-calorie images in their bilateral anterior prefrontal cortex, an area associated with cognition and planning, while lower weight participants had greater activation in their sensor motor areas of the brain, the regions concerned with visual and sensation processing such as the left hemisphere postcentral gyrus, the insula, and the parahippocampal gyrus, all in response to the high-calorie images. Again, those concerned with weight, at least potentially, tend to be less visually stimulated by images of food and tend to be more cognitively activated instead, thinking about their food choices. After eating the meal, wherein both groups of participants ate about the same amount of calories, there was even a stronger reaction in thinking and planning regions of the brain, including the ACC and the caudate, in the overweight participants, particularly in response to high-calorie food images. In other words, what we see again is that people struggling with their weight tend to think about food actively rather than visually. However, Masterson and all's data indicated that in turn, decreased visual processing of branded foods in particular may actually lead to greater consumption of food. 
That's a lot of information to take in, I know, but let's consider what it means when we're not only talking about branded food, but food that is both branded and being sold as healthy. It means overweight people may not process that information visually, which may mean a greater degree of consumption due to that brand effect, but may also produce decreased activity in the cognitive regions of their brains that would normally be thinking about the high calorie content of these unhealthy foods when it's being sold as a healthy alternative and when they are overweight. My point here is that in selling branded unhealthy food products under the guise of them being impossibly delicious and containing no cholesterol and no meat and therefore being good for you is probably the most dangerous to overweight people when it comes to susceptibility of persuasion in advertisements. For overweight people, their brains will not process the visual information as closely and instead focus on the false health information, leading them to potentially make bad health decisions. I'm trying to slim down so I can fit into mama's coffin. Finally, in regards to not just branding, but the social media and general social aspect, particularly of the Impossible Whopper in many of these campaigns, which have been promoted heavily by many mukbang and food review channels, again, no shade on my boy review bra, but the free advertising that Burger King and other companies get from these personalities who conduct these food reviews may in and of themselves have a major effect on people's eating behavior as illustrated by Zhou Shapiro and Wansink 2017. Participants in this study watched a movie trailer for Harold and Kumar go to White Castle and were asked which character they identified with more, then watched one of two clips from the full film, either depicting the two gorging themselves on burgers and fries or the aftermath of their binge. After watching, they were asked about their feelings of parasocial liking for the characters and were allowed to select a snack which they ate while completing several questionnaires. Ah, uh, Batman, like when we get to the Batcave, could I get a little snack? Yes, Shaggy, we'll all have a snack. Those who watched the eating scenes took significantly more food after watching the clip than those who watched the post-eating scene. People who identified with the characters also ate more than those who did not. People who watched Harold and Kumar stuffing their faces were more likely to choose a savory snack like Chex Mex, while those who watched them finish eating chose, perhaps appropriately, a dessert being 3.7 times more likely to select M&Ms as their choice of snack. These results were unaffected by differences in individual participant age, sex, or BMI. What this means, though, is that watching people eating food makes us, well, more likely to eat. While this may be a general problem with mukbangs, when combined with the parasocial relationship that people feel for YouTubers and the effects of branding in addition to health messages, this probably means both a lot of money for companies selling meat alternatives as healthy options and a lot of people making mistakenly unhealthy choices thinking that they're being health conscious. Although don't get me wrong, I don't think anyone watching Trisha Paytas or Joey's World Tour think that they're making a healthy decision by going to Burger King. <laughs> but speaking of the effects that health messages have on our behavior, though, let's look more into that, because the Impossible Whopper is far from the first time a major corporation has used health messages to push a product for profit. Are we really so easily convinced that a product is healthy just because advertising and labeling says it is? And are we more likely to choose an unhealthy product just because of the way that it's described? Additionally, given these products are so much more expensive than the baseline goods, are we really willing to pay a premium for food that we're told is healthier for us, regardless of the reality of the situation? Obviously, marketing is a complicated business. That's why companies spend millions upon millions every year figuring out how best to show their products to consumers. However, as I mentioned previously, a lot of times we don't think too carefully about our food choices, and even when we do, that might not stop us from making bad decisions. Just how easy is it, then, to convince people that food is better for them and perhaps persuade particularly those trying to lose weight to purchase a product? Well, Sutterline and Sargeist, 2015, found it may be as easy as changing a single word. How a person's sense of consciousness can be so transformed by nothing more magical than listening to words. In a series of experiments, Swiss participants were asked to rate how healthy they thought a cereal was after looking at the nutrition label. The only difference between the two cereals they saw was that one contained sugar and the other contained fruit sugar. 
They consistently reported the cereal with fruit sugar as healthier, even when the cereal itself contained no fruit, and regardless of whether or not the product contained a claim about containing fruit sugar on the front of the package or on the nutrition side label. Additionally, both participants who were high and low in health consciousness were equally as susceptible to perceiving the cereal containing fruit sugar as a healthier option. While not all sugar is processed the same way by the body, and fruit sugar is not identical to refined sugar, ultimately one isn't really healthier for you than the other, but that doesn't apparently stop us from erroneously thinking that it is. After all, sugar is bad, but fruits are good, right? This is called the health halo effect, in that people perceive fruit as healthy, so therefore anything that includes fruit must also be healthy. No, everybody else's tobacco is poisonous. Lucky Strikes is toasted. The same halo effect has been found to apply to protein bars, as Fernand, Schultz, and Niederdepp, 2017, illustrated by slightly manipulating the packaging. Participants who saw the bar labeled as being a good source of protein, or with protein in the title, as you might expect, thought that the bar contained more protein. While those who saw bars with a nutritional traffic light on the package believed that the bar contained fewer calories, but also more sugar. Believing the bars had more sugar was negatively related to perceptions of healthiness, but both being labeled as a protein bar or as a good source of protein led participants to believe that there was more protein and fiber in the product and subsequently view that protein bar as healthier. This health halo applies to all kinds of labels on the foods that we eat. For example, Prada et al. 2019 found the same thing applied to gluten-free foods, which really only benefit those who are suffering from celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. They asked Portuguese participants to label what food items actually contain gluten, rate the healthiness of two loaves of bread, one labeled as gluten-free, as well as their own dietary habits and their general opinions on gluten-free diets. In general, people weren't very good at identifying what foods even contained gluten. As while most were pretty sure that seafood sticks did not, they were also fairly certain that rice did. Rice, of course, does not contain gluten, while seafood sticks, artificial crab meat, in general does. Participants believed that all gluten-free products, including flour, bread, rice, and rice crackers, again, the latter of two don't contain gluten naturally, were all healthier and lower in calories when they were labeled as gluten-free, but they didn't perceive them as necessarily tastier. In actuality, while many gluten-free foodstuffs are about equal in calories, many other gluten-free products contain more calories than the full gluten versions. For example, glutino pretzel sticks have 20 more calories per serving than a serving of rolled gold pretzel sticks. This is because gluten-free foods often use more fat to compensate for the floury taste that gluten alternatives often have, usually because they contain rice or tapioca. Additionally, if you do think that you have a gluten allergy and are just on the hype train that gluten-free is healthier inherently without an official diagnosis, you may want to think again before paying a premium for gluten-free products. As Zanini et al. 2015 found in a trial of people who reported symptoms of gluten sensitivity and were given either a placebo or a pill containing gluten, only 34% of those who felt they were gluten sensitive had non-celiac gluten sensitivity. My favorite Aussie baker mom, Anne Reardon, recently did a really great video debunking some other myths about gluten-free foods, which I'll link in a card and down below if you want to learn more about that particular health fad and why it may not only be causing people to pack on the pounds, but potentially be seriously harmful for those who do suffer from celiac disease. When what was once treated as seriously as any other food allergy is now seen by many as little more than a pop diet. What the f*** is gluten? Take that shit out. It's gluten-free. I don't care if it's free. Swear on your Yeezys. If you want to fight, we gonna fight. You trying to be on world star? It doesn't just stop there either. We can see the exact same thing with fair trade labels from Schultz, Muller, and Schwartz 2012, who found that both chocolate and cookies that were labeled as fair trade when they were considered ethical products were also viewed as having fewer calories than the unethical non-fair trade cookies. Yes, cookies so unethical that their solution to the trolley problem is multi-track drifting. Same goes for organic food, as assessed by Benson et al. 2019, who found people were ready to yeet non-organic cookies out of a cookie gun in terms of health 
preference, viewing the mere label of organic as indicative that the pack of cookies contained fewer calories. Participants also believed it was acceptable to eat more organic cookies, or at least eat them more frequently, as a part of a healthy diet. In other words, health fads easily influence us into thinking something is healthy just because of its label. Thus, finally, and relating back to the main topic of today's video, that means, yes, the health halo effect also applies to vegetarian options. Besson, Buxom, and Jalbert, 2020, in an initial study, asked participants to guess the calories and healthiness of two fast food items, a McDonald's Big Mac and their recently launched Grand Veggie Burger, as well as the participants' intentions to eat one item over the other. Consistently, participants rated the Grand Veggie as lower in calories than the Big Mac, despite the fact that in reality, quite the opposite is the case, with the Grand Veggie containing 763 calories versus 503 calories in the traditional Big Mac. Despite this, though, participants didn't say they would condone eating more fast food, nor were they more likely to eat the Grand Veggie than the Big Mac, except when they themselves were vegetarians or vegans, obviously showing some greater intention to eat at McDonald's when there was a vegetarian option. The halo of vegetarianism applying to perceived health of the individual items also had no effect on other side items, meaning people weren't more likely to accompany their grand veggie with two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, and so on. To provide further illumination of this effect, the researchers conducted a second experiment with a then non-existent vegetarian option from Burger King, as this was before the launch of the Impossible Whopper, called by the researchers the Veggie Whopper. This time, participants were told they had already ordered an item, either the classic Whopper or the vegetarian option, followed by a list of ingredients of the two sandwiches, which differed only in that one contained a beef steak and the other a vegetarian steak. Those in the vegetarian condition were then told that the Whopper contained 660 calories and asked to guess if the Veggie Whopper had greater or fewer calories itself. Participants could then select a few various side dishes, ranging from chili to fries to a garden salad, as well as a soft drink, and were asked how likely they thought they would be to eat the meal that they had assembled in a real order. Once again, participants believed that the Veggie Whopper would have fewer calories than the classic, but also, as before, this perception did not cause them to load up on some side diabetes in lieu of the calories that they thought the burger itself was cutting from the meal. Branding, again, can have an impact when a certain company is selling a supposedly healthy alternative, and we can see that further from Choi and Reed 2018. While in a first study, in which participants were shown an advertisement for a veggie sandwich from either Subway or Burger King, people, but particularly women, were more positive toward the ad from Subway, viewing the product as healthier and feeling less guilt about potentially purchasing the sandwich compared to the similar Burger King alternative. However, an interesting effect occurred when brand loyalty and health consciousness were taken into consideration in a second study. This time, participants saw an ad for a Southwest chicken salad, either from Panera Bread or from Taco Bell, and while for Panera Bread, those who loved the company were about as likely to say they would purchase the salad regardless of their own personal health consciousness, Taco Bell was a little bit different. Those high in health consciousness and who loved Taco Baco reported themselves as being the most likely to buy the, quote, healthy option from Taco Bell, which increased as their fondness for the restaurant chain did. Those low in health consciousness generally didn't care much either way. Now that's what I call a tinkle outside the binkle. What that means, though, is that for health-conscious people, perhaps those trying to lose weight or who care about watching their weight, who are also fond of a fast food brand, are probably a lot more likely to purchase the supposedly healthy options that that restaurant offers than those who just don't care so much. Listen, I am telling you, you better listen to me, SpongeBob! You like Krabby Patties, don't you, Squidward? People are, as we have seen, easily influenced not only by claims of health, but by brand imaging. And it may be so that those who are health conscious and have a pre-existing liking for a brand are the most susceptible to this exposure. And speaking of Subway, there's really no better example than that particular chain. Subway's entire marketing model, after all, is kind of based on the perception that their food is healthy, right? Well, for obvious reasons, they've distanced themselves from Jared. Their image for years was the fast food chain that helped some guy lose hundreds of pounds. And as a result, people consistently underestimate the calories in Subway food, as Chandon and Wansink 2007 found. While people generally tended to underestimate the calories in their fast food, both McDonald's and in Subway, 
They found that people who evaluated the calories of a Subway meal, actually consisting of over 1,300 calories, generally thought that meal contained less than half that calorie amount. While those who were less health conscious tended to underestimate the calories in McDonald's meals, those high in health consciousness tended to overestimate how bad Mickey D's was. However, both groups vastly underestimated the calories in Subway products. Likely as a result of this perception, participants reported being more likely to order regular sodas or cookies as side orders at Subway rather than at McDonald's, which only further increases the total calorie intake from their meal. Specifically, participants expected that they were eating less than 500 calories in their Subway meal, consisting of a 12-inch BMT with sides, when in reality, they were eating over 1,000 calories. If it's not clear at this point, simply saying something is healthy often makes us think that it is. And as a result, not only vastly underestimate the amount of food that we're eating, but also overestimate the healthiness of our eating behavior. And branding only makes this potentially more powerful, whether the brand is healthy or the branded object is healthy. The problem with the influence labeling things as healthy clearly has then, directly or indirectly, lies not in just how easy it is to convince people that they're eating healthy, but also in its prevalence in advertising. Whalen and All 2018 found an increase from 20.7% to 24.8% in the inclusion of health messages of unhealthy food products and advertising in British television ads in general between 2008 and 2010. Specifically though, they found substantial increases in health-related messages included in advertisements shown in children's programming blocks, increasing from 17.1% of food adverts during peak child viewing times in 2008, rising to 33% in 2010. In terms of the actual health of these types of products being advertised, while over 41% claim to be part of the Brit Bong NHS five-a-day regimen of fruits and veggies, Garcia et al. 2018 found 70% of these products contained less than 80 milligrams of five-a-day essentials. Sunny delight counts towards your five-a-day as minus two. Despite the fact that over 41% also made claims about the nutrition of their products in advertisements, 40% similarly failed to be classified as healthy under the Ofcom nutrient profiling model. Additionally, 61% of products that claimed to have no sugar additives in these ads were found to contain fruit puree, concentrate, or both. Further, Unidol 2009 found that health claims were particularly prominent in fast food advertising, with more than 40% of all ads that mentioned health benefits being those for fast food, comprising far more so than any other type of food product being advertised. Fast food ads were also more likely than other type of unhealthy food categories to promote general nutrients in their products, with over 17% of all ads mentioning general nutrients for fast food joints. So, we know that this crap is unhealthy, we know that advertising is misleading, and that it's not uncommon, and we can see how easily susceptible we are into thinking something is healthy when it's simply implied to be so, even with a simple label or just a descriptor. But are we really willing to pay a premium for the privilege of being lied to? We've seen that we can be easily duped by labels in terms of thinking food is healthier, but does that mean we're willing to pay more for those products? Unlike the fairly clear-cut evidence regarding the effects of persuasion and advertising on making us think things are healthy, the data here aren't so definitive. And the answer may be, well, it depends. Let's look at some examples, though. To start out, let's go back to a study we've already looked at because Besson et al. 2019 found no relationship between organic labeling and willingness to pay more. Instead, people with more negative attitudes towards organic products are less willing to pay for that type of product. But is this always the case with all labeling? Well, Rodiger 2018 conducted a study with German participants, wherein they were given a set of glasses that tracked eye movement and were then asked to walk into a simulated market environment and select a jar of fruit and a package of fusilli noodles that they would need to pay for with their own money. These items varied in price and were either organic or non-organic. The glasses were used to track their fixation on the prices of the objects. And participants were also asked about their typical consuming behaviors. For conventional consumers, those who don't buy a lot of organic, 57.7% took the lowest-priced non-organic jam, 
and 54.9% the lowest price conventional noodles. In the group of occasional organic consumers, most instead went for the low-priced organic jam, and while the majority selected the lower-priced conventional noodles, 29.5% also chose the low-priced organic noodles and 18.2% bought the higher-priced organic noodles. For regular organic product consumers, all of them purchased only organic products, although the vast majority went for the cheaper options, 64% and 82% respectively selecting the cheaper jam and pasta. In terms of eye tracking, the prices of the organic products were actually fixated on less frequently by all participants than the conventional products, while occasional organic consumers were the most likely to ignore prices in general compared to other groups. In other words, people who already buy organic products, which we know elicit a perception of healthiness, are going to buy them more often regardless. But people less concerned with the health effects of potentially buying organic are probably just more concerned with price. A survey from Bat et al. 2007, using samples of U.S. consumers shopping at specialty food stores such as Whole Foods or traditional grocery stores, further kind of illustrates this trend. Again, those already shopping at specialty stores were more willing to pay a premium. Specifically, as the percentage of organic ingredients increased from less than 70% to 70.95% to 95% to 100%, the probability that a specialty store consumer was willing to pay more increased by 10 to 16 to 17 and all the way up to 21% relative to non-specialty store consumers. Compared to whether or not the person was already shopping at a specialty store, perceptions of the healthiness of goods themselves had little effect on participants' willingness to pay for these products. Additionally, women in general were just more willing to pay for organic or non-GMO foodstuffs than were men. Parents were also more likely than non-parents to pay more for organic cereal. So, people who are already into the health food kick are just more prone to keep buying it. Oh my god, organic yoga pants. It's like they read my tweet last night. My dog is gonna love these. However, again, this may mean that messages about health benefits of, let's say, fast food, even when none are present, may be more effective on those who are more health conscious and already trying to shop healthy. In an analysis of Canadian consumers, Hamazawa Asosi, definitely pronouncing that wrong, and Zahaf 2012, found similarly that most people aren't willing to pay exorbitant prices for organic health food, but chronic consumers are occasionally willing to pay a pretty high price for organic goods. They found that the majority of buyers who sporadically or entirely already consume organic products are prepared to pay up to about 30% more for those products in general. However, there was a small percentage 1.9% of hardcore organic consumers who reported they would be willing to spend up to 120% more on organic dairy and vegetables, and 1.3% who reported being down to spend that much for organic bread and fruit. For sporadic organic consumers, environmental concerns were their most common reasonings for buying organic, but it was closely followed by beliefs in the health benefits of eating organic. And similarly, for the more adamant organic buyers, while support for the local economy was their number one rationale, health reasons followed by in a close second. For infrequent organic consumers, once again, health concerns were the number one reason for purchasing these products. And across all groups, health just barely eked out ahead as the top rationale and reasoning for shopping organic. Further indicative of the importance of health claims when it comes to willingness to pay a premium for organic or supposedly more healthy food is evidence from data from Van Dorn and Verhoof, 2011. They gave Dutch participants various information related to orange juice, both organic and non-organic, emphasizing the health of the product or the high sugar content of the product, and assessed their perceptions and willingness to pay for organic orange juice. Those who were given the vice-heavy description of the sugary OJ were less positive towards the organic product, but generally, being organic had little effect on their willingness to buy it. They were down to buy it either way. They were more willing to buy, however, when they believed it was of a higher quality and healthier, but also when they thought it was unhealthy but would improve their social standing. In a second study, they included various healthy and unhealthy products listed as either organic or non-organic with a wider selection of products, and the perceived virtue of the organic foods was related to a greater willingness to purchase the goods. In other words, if you thought that you would get a kind of social boost by shopping organic, well, you might be more likely to buy it. Fair trade coffee. If you don't like it, 
you're racist. People with a higher education background were ironically, I suppose, more likely to believe that organic foods were inherently healthier and were therefore more willing to buy them, as were women, while individual levels of health consciousness had no actual effect on the willingness to purchase organic products. Not all people in all places as we've seen then are equally as likely to purchase foods just because they have a label that may be perceived of as somehow healthier, and generally, a lot of people do believe organic food is healthier. A 2015 report from Health Focus International found that 87% of Americans and 90% of Europeans believed at least somewhat that non-GMO foods were healthier, when in reality, the research just doesn't support that. A meta-analysis from Smith & Spangler et al. 2012 found no difference in the nutritional values of GMO versus non-GMO foods, and while they also found that consuming organic products may reduce the risk of exposure to antibiotic-resistant bacteria and pesticides, these foods aren't inherently better for your health. But clearly that doesn't stop many from being willing to pay a premium though, as illustrated again in McFadden and Huffman 2017, who asked participants to bid on several items, including apples, eggs, and broccoli, labeled as conventional, natural, or organic, and found that the mean bid for the natural and organic foods was higher for all food types and received higher max bids than the conventional food items. Concerns with health played a role here, as subjects who regularly read food labels were willing to pay premiums that were 34 cents higher than those who did not. Women in general were willing to pay more, with an average of 19 cents higher for organic or natural premiums than men were, as were people with families, who were willing to spend an average of 68 cents more on average for organic foods relative to conventional commodities. A study from Bruno and Campbell 2016 asked students at the University of Connecticut if they would be willing to pay more into their meal plan for organic, local, and non-GMO options, and again, many of these supposedly cash-strapped kids were willing to pay a premium, if not their own money, than their parents, with 50% saying they were willing to pay more for organic and local foods, and 36% being willing to pay more for non-GMO options in their meal plan. In terms of just how much more they were willing to pay, prices ranged from twice as much as the current cost for organic and local products up to three times as much for non-GMO products to be on the menu. Thus, we can see that across various types of foods that are proclaimed to be healthier for us, regardless of the veracity of those claims, yes, in many cases, we may be willing to pay a premium just for a label on a product. But as always, we have to ask why that might be the case. Jung and Lundy were interested in the framing of organic and antibiotic-free as well as non-GMO products, and if it would encourage people to pay more if the associated advertising was based on the health risks of not using the product or the health gains by using the product. And interestingly, found that people reported being willing to pay more for organic bananas regardless of how the message was framed, be it a loss or a gain more so than they were for antibiotic-free milk or non-GMO cereal. This means that labeling is potentially more important than information about the product itself, as we kind of already know. Better than LA County water. We're pretty sure the hose added that glacial taste that was so widely praised. Certainly, as we looked at in the previous segment, health perceptions play a role here, but let's look at how the brain itself perceives these labels and why these results may be the case. Fast 2017 showed German participants images of logos of popular fast food brands and organic products and studied the reactions to the images in their brains via fMRI scan. The fast food images elicited greater activation in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, a region related to fear and self-control. In contrast, the organic food logos provoked greater response in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, an area related to planning and decision-making. In other words, Fast food elicits potential feelings of harm, fear, and avoidance, while the mere logo of health food makes the regions of our brain more concerned with planning more active. People think they are making good decisions and are willing to pay more out of that perception. To answer the question then, are we willing to pay a premium for persuasion? The answer is sometimes. People who are thinking a lot about health are probably likely to already purchase products labeled as healthy and are willing to pay more. But in general, people are drawn to healthy labels, and yes, many will be willing to pay a premium for that labeling. 
This again means, though, that those who are more likely to be drawn in by the health claims levied by these fast food joints are probably the exact group of people, either those more health conscious and potentially even those more averse to eating traditionally fast food or junk food meals, as well as those trying to lose weight who are the most susceptible and most likely to want to try it. In this way, Marketing vegetarian options by emphasizing their healthiness and the impossibility of the item is really smart marketing for the bottom line. And at the same time, it's also incredibly disingenuous and potentially may lead to a lot of people making a lot of poor health choices while erroneously thinking that they're eating healthier. I'll be the last person to suggest that restaurants shouldn't be allowed to sell giant tubs of pure distilled diabetes if they want to and there's a demand for it free market and all. I also picked up a 64 ounce Sweetums Sugar Splash. Damn it, I love this country so much. But it's still important to be aware of how easily these media messages can create a false perception in the mind of consumers that not only may lead them to eating worse while thinking they're eating better, but paying a premium for the privilege of being duped. So, while the Impossible Whopper and other fast food attempts to use vegetarian options as a way to make a quick buck on the population of people desperate to try every new fad or diet that they think might help them shed a few pounds, we do need to quickly address the question, is a vegetarian diet actually healthier, even if these individual fast food items are not, as we know they are not? Look, I don't want to spend too much time actually talking about veganism or vegetarianism and the health effects of it because it, well, doesn't really concern me. I'm a media psychology sped, not a dietitian. But for the sake of accuracy, we do need to briefly mention all of this. In regards to these fast food alternatives, first and foremost, and really all I majorly have to say about them besides the fact that they're not healthy, is that they're also not vegan. <laughs> And on the Money Watch, a vegan has filed a lawsuit in Miami federal court against Burger King, claiming the Impossible Whopper is falsely advertised. The suit accuses Burger King of deceptive practices by not disclosing meatless patties and regular burgers are cooked on the same grill. The patties are cooked on the same range as all the other burgers, and yes, I know they're supposed to clean them, but do you really think they're doing that for minimum wage? So wow, that delicious soil hemoglobin may make the burger look and taste and even bleed like real beef, it is still probably covered in some byproducts of actual beef burgers. If you're not too extreme about your vegan eating habits, then maybe that's fine for you. But for a lot of people who choose to go vegan for moral or ethical reasons, just be aware that your meatless burger is probably covered in little bits of meat detritus anyway, and you are consuming little bits of that meat product when you eat an Impossible Whopper. This goes for pretty much all meatless options. If your choice to go vegan or vegetarian is based on health reasons, a few specks of said meat detritus aren't going to do anything, but I still feel it's important to take note of anyway, because the point of all of this for Burger King and other fast food restaurants isn't to show their support for healthier lifestyles or eating habits, nor for vegans or vegetarian lifestyles. It's to bump their bottom line by charging you more for an arguably unhealthier product. Just like when Burger King advertised their pink tax good girl point nuggies to show support for feminism. That wasn't about feminism, it was about profit, plain and simple. All of this is marketing and it's clearly working at least to a degree. If you object to the mistreatment of animals, then buying an overpriced faux burger cooked on the same griddle with the millions of other beef products everyone else is eating isn't really helping animals now, is it? I'm not saying don't eat it, just that you're still supporting Burger King, which makes its money on beef burgers. And I do find it a bit ridiculous that the second I even announced I was working on this video, I had several vegans all caps text screaming at me in support of said multi-billion dollar company that profits on the massive use of animal products because I was critical of said company's marketing methods. If you are a vegan or a vegetarian and you find yourself getting angry at this video, and I know most of you, my dear friends, are not getting angry because you're a bit bigger brain than that, but some of you might be, and some seem to be really irked at the idea that anyone would be at all concerned with the advertising of these products as healthy because they are vegan or vegetarian and view the fact that the product is on the menu as a good thing. And I agree, it probably is a good thing to have the alternative, but 
My issue is that it's in no way healthier and it's being sold as such and being perceived as such. If you are getting angry at this video, then maybe it's time to consider how much that specific marketing, that labeling I'm talking about, has affected you. And instead, direct that anger towards the fact that, let's say, Othman and Karim, 2016, found that positive attitudes towards halal food being clean or healthy is the leading reason why non-Muslims, at least in Malaysia, purchase halal products, which is not what aboutism, but rather just a prediction in that I wouldn't be shocked if halal label foods will have the same health halo effect as vegetarian or organic or fair trade products currently do in perceptions of health in the near future. And I don't know if you know about how halal food is handled, but let's just say I'm not going to show it in this video because even even though all of my content is demonetized, yeah, even that's too bit of a spicy meatball, excuse the pun, for me to show here. My point is, don't get mad. I'm just criticizing the company. I'm not criticizing vegetarians or vegans. Because regardless of the vegan status or not, you're still eating high sodium junk if you're eating at Burger King, which I think most people know, which of course makes it delicious, but doesn't make it a healthier option. And if instead the reason you're eating vegan or vegetarian is health related, and we know as we saw with data that many people think that vegan and vegetarian options are healthier just based on the label, then again, Again, you're not eating healthier by eating the Impossible Whopper. But hey, there are real reasons to go vegetarian, and I want to make that clear because I don't know if the rest of you guys know this, but there are a lot of vegans and vegetarians on the internet who get, oh, let's just say, just a tiny little itty bitty bit absolutely incomprehensibly irate if they think you're in some way taking a swing at their diet. Vegetarian party! So in this segment, I'm going to just briefly describe the actual health benefits of vegetarian and vegan diets to assuage those of you who have probably long since flocked to the comments to call me all kinds of names. As I said in the beginning, I don't care what you eat. I just don't like bad advertising and manipulative persuasion tactics. But that being said, let's briefly take a look at the benefits of a vegan or vegetarian diet. A comparison of nutrients from various diets from Clarice et al. 2014 found that vegetarians, including variants such as semi-vegetarians and pescatarians, eat fewer calories on average than omnivores, and vegans tend to consume the lowest average amount of calories. As a result, and as a review of research on vegan diets from Craig 2009 reports, vegans do tend to have a lower than average BMI than omnivores. Vegans and vegetarians generally also tend to consume less fat and less sodium than omnivores do. Vegans specifically consume significantly less cholesterol. As a result, it's not a surprise that Craig's review found that vegans' total LDL cholesterol levels were between 32% and 44% lower than that of omnivores. As you probably know, high sodium and high cholesterol are associated with stroke and heart attack, and a meta-analysis from Dinu et al. 2017 did confirm that vegetarians have in general a 25% decreased risk of cardiovascular health problems than omnivores do. Their meta-analysis also indicated, as previous assessments have, that vegans generally have a lower risk of some cancers than meat eaters do. So all in all, this sounds like veganism and vegetarianism are good things, right? Well, as with everything else, it's good in moderation and while taking care of yourself. While vegans and vegetarians consume less sodium and less cholesterol, they also get less of vitamins D and B12. For these reasons, it's important if you do choose to go vegan or vegetarian to carefully monitor these nutrients. Wu, Kwok, and Kaelmeyer, 2014, note that not only do 50 to 70 percent of vegans and vegetarians have some form of B12 deficiency, but that increased cardioid intermedia thickness occurs in populations with that B12 deficiency. That means that while reduced consumption of cholesterol may protect against some cardiovascular issues, not maintaining a proper balance of B12 vitamins could lead to its own atherosclerosis-related diseases. In Wu's sample of Hong Kong vegetarians, they didn't find that same issue with B12 deficiencies in lacto-vegetarians. So again, a little bit can go a long way to maintain a healthy balance. Just watch your nutrients. And there are plenty of other nutrients that are lacking or more difficult to obtain in a typical vegan or vegetarian diet, such as N3 fatty acid, which can be important for cardiovascular health. But in our first world environment, there are ways to ensure that you can get these nutrients or supplements for them while still eating a vegan or vegetarian diet. Overall, eating a healthy and balanced vegan or vegetarian lifestyle in a lot of ways is probably healthier than the general omnivorous one in terms of heart health and caloric intake, as well as sodium and cholesterol. 
It may help protect you against certain cancers and generally lead to a healthier heart. I hope you're ready to eat my asshole, George. And I hope you know I'm vegetarian. Ah, here we go. But as I said, it's not so simple if you don't keep your other macronutrients into consideration, and certainly, eating vegetarian just to lose weight probably isn't going to help you obtain that goal alone. After all, you can certainly get a lot of calories from a vegan and particularly a vegetarian meal if it concerns all pasta, for example. When it concerns weight loss, the answer is pretty simple. There's just no shortcuts or quick solutions. If a vegan or a vegetarian diet sounds right for you, provided you watch your B12, vitamin D, and other macronutrients, you might really be doing your body a favor. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that an omnivorous diet is inherently worse, provided again you watch your cholesterol and sodium and calorie intake. All things, dear friends, in moderation. Now, as a last point, I have to mention the soy question, because there's no way I could end this video without touching on it, not only because it's a meme, soy boy! but because not so long ago, veterinarian James Strangle, wow, great name, dude, made headlines by claiming that consuming the Impossible Whopper or other meatless alternatives would cause men to grow titties. Of course, the soy boy meme, as I mentioned, has been around for a long time and is played out by this point. But is there any validity to any of this? Well, yes and no. Soy-based products like the Impossible Whopper and many other meatless alternatives contain soy lehemoglobin, which is a substance that makes the product look and taste like meat and also contains a lot of phytoestrogen, which is plant estrogen and not identical to human estrogen hormones, let me be clear. Another thing to note is that there are other alternatives like the Beyond Burger that contains pea protein and not soy lehemoglobin. But there are reasons why people are a little concerned about phytoestrogens in their food, because in animals there have been some concerning results of consumption of these phytoestrogens. For example, Witten et al. 1995 found sexual dysfunction in male rats that consumed milk from mothers fed large amounts of phytoestrogens, as well as a suppression of the estrus cycle in the adult female rats. In a review of soy and the effects of phytoestrogens in Jargon 2014, he noted that consuming soy products helped reduce the side effects of menopause in women, indicating that it does mimic the effects of natural human estrogen in the system. Further, Javaro et al. 2008 found that in men who consumed large amounts of soy, between the 75 and 95th percentile of consumers, so very heavy consumers, particularly those who were overweight or obese, they tended to have a lower concentration of their little swimmers, although they did not experience decreased sperm motility or unusual sperm morphology. The potential feminization effects of soy that get spread around a lot were widely reported and circulated based on a single case study from Martisan and Luai 2018 regarding a 60-year-old man who presented with PP dysfunction and gynecomastia, the growth of breasts after consuming an average of three quarts of soy milk a day. After cessation of the consumption of soy milk, he reported decreased tenderness in his moobs and a decrease in esteritol. So once again, as I said, the takeaway from everything I'm talking about here is everything in moderation. After all, other research, as seen in a review from Messina and Messina 2010, indicates that the consumption of soy to a moderate degree may actually help guard against breast cancer, as well as cardiovascular disease, and may aid in renal function. So again, you're probably fine to consume soy in small doses or normal doses, just don't chug three quarts of it a day. I mean, unless you want to grow your own pair of mommy's milkies. Give it, give it, give it now! Consuming three quarts of just about everything a day, besides maybe water, is probably just not going to be good for you. While Dr. Strangle, again, absolutely great name, warned that the consumption of the Impossible Whopper may lead to similar cases as those reported by Martinez and Luai, let's be clear about how many burgers you would have to eat to get the same effect. First of all, yes, the Impossible Whopper has a whopping amount of phytoestrogens, containing 44 milligrams compared to the classic Whopper, which contains 2.5 nanograms. But compared to other soy-based products and meat alternatives, that's still really high. According to a report from Harvard, the average soy patty contains only 5 milligrams of isoflavones, or phytoestrogens, and a cup of soy milk, only 6 milligrams. 
If Strangle's estimate of the 44 milligrams of phytoestrogen in the Impossible Whopper is correct, then eating four Impossible Whoppers a day would put you in range of eating enough soy to fall into the same category as drinking three quarts of soy milk then. That's a lot of burgers though. In which case, considering their high calorie and high sodium levels, I think you might have some more immediate health concerns, but sure, the claim isn't completely unfounded. Again, remember that this concern is all based on a single case study, but it's not entirely based on fiction. That means we should neither blindly accept Snopes' absurd giant red false stamp regarding the possible health concerns with gobbling down massive amounts of soy, nor start panicking that a survey of edamame will cause you to start growing big juicy breasts. My plump juicy breasts are none of your goddamned business. Have some sense here, lads, and I know that most of you do. Eating a soy burger is not going to feminize you, but if you consume the equivalent of three freaking quarts every single day, yeah, you might have some sperm concentration issues. And yeah, particularly as an older man with a lower native testosterone level, you may grow boobies. If you keep doing it, at least for a prolonged period of time and to an excessive degree. So one last and final time, and say it with me now, dear friends, the moral of this story is everything in moderation. And with that, let's come to some conclusions about this entire silly topic. The purpose of this video is a simple one. Don't believe everything you read or hear because it's so easy to manipulate our perceptions by just changing a label on a food product or changing how it's advertised. Of course, food is heavily regulated, so it's not as if companies can outright lie about the contents of their products, but they can change perceptions and encourage purchasing behavior by labeling their food as fair trade, organic, gluten-free, vegetarian, maybe even halal, and then charging exorbitant prices for it as we've seen, and many people will happily pay more thinking they are eating healthier. While there's nothing inherently unhealthy about eating vegetarian or vegan as we discussed, it's easy for many to be convinced that because a product is vegetarian or vegan, it's somehow healthier and lower in calories. As previously mentioned, I have no issue with Burger King making money, but I do find it disconcerting that so many people are seemingly being taken for a ride by advertising that emphasizes health based on popular dieting fads and trends when the products themselves are in no way healthier for you, which subsequently may cause people to make poor health decisions. Of course, your actions are your own, my dear friends, and you should eat whatever the hell you want. But when people are so easily swayed by the health halo effect, this can cause people to make serious errors in their eating habits when they are trying to change them. But hey, what do you guys think? Have you ever thought a product was healthier based on it being labeled as organic or vegetarian or fair trade or what have you? Is this really a matter of public health concern? And if so, is the onus on the companies doing the advertising? Or is it on the consumer to know better than to fall for the grift? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. As always, an enormous thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon, Subscribestar, and Streamlabs. Thank you guys so much. Your guys' support means everything to me. You allow me to keep making this content at the frequency which I do, which I know is not that frequent. It's also incredibly disheartening when all of my videos get demonetized, and that's why I do have to apologize, but I have to continually take sponsors, such as today's lovely sponsor, Surfshark VPN. If you guys like these videos and want to support the channel, there's several links down below to my merch store, as well as, again, my Patreon, Subscribestar, and so on. Thank you guys for watching, and as always, dear friends, all Tana Volt.